Naked Gun movies, Hertz commercials. He was an American icon. Uh, but uh, his uh, racial overtones very much surrounded uh, the trial in 1995. The defence, a central plank of their defence of him, uh, was the question whether or not a black man could receive yes, I, I, a fair trial in the circumstances surrounding O.J. Simpson at the time, a black man who was accused of killing a white woman. In the event, a predominantly black jury acquitted him. And you're looking at pictures from the 1995 trial there. These pictures are of the very famous car chase that took place just prior to O.J. Simpson's arrest, just after uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman had been found brutally stabbed to death. Um, and this, for many of us, that car chase, for the, the international audience, was when O.J. Simpson came to prominence and we began to learn who he was and what he was accused of. He was inside that white Ford Bronco with uh, a former NFL teammate uh, who had told police that O.J. Simpson was in the back of the car with a gun to his head, clearly uh, mentally unstable or apparently mentally unstable at the time. That created that uh, police pursuit. Ultimately, it ended in a courtroom in 1995 uh, where there was deemed by many to be uh, an overwhelming amount of, over of evidence against O.J. Simpson, enough to convict him. Uh, and it was a surprise indeed to many when he was acquitted. There was a, a civil suit lodged by the parents of uh, Ron Goldman a couple of years after he was acquitted. And you see the scenes there of him uh, being found not guilty, his lawyer Johnny Cochran behind him, hugging him. That civil suit uh, found him liable for murder. He was ordered to pay more than $30 million to the families of his victims. But O.J. Simpson's legal troubles did not end there. In 2008, he, in the company of others, uh, in a situation where weapons were involved, went into a Las Vegas hotel room, seeking to retrieve memorabilia that he uh, claimed had been stolen from him. That landed him uh, in court on charges of armed robbery and kidnapping. And ultimately, uh, he was found guilty of on that case and was sent to jail. Following his release, he lived a, a relatively quiet life. Uh, latterly, he had been suffering from prostate cancer and in his final few months uh, was in uh, a hospice. He lived, as I say, in his final few years, a relatively quiet life, although he was active on social media, commenting on sports, politics, and other topics, but he won't be remembered for his social media activity. He will be remembered as, as a young man who made it big. I mean, life was difficult for O.G. Simpson in the beginning. He was a, a kid from a poor neighborhood, had rickets as a child, uh, and his mother made braces for him. Ultimately, he transformed into one of this country's finest athletes and most successful running backs in the sport of NFL. He was drafted by the Buffalo Bills as a youngster and uh, broke all sorts of records on the football field. He was a football star with good looks and his transfer onto the silver screen almost came naturally. As I say, he was a, a prominent name uh, in films like uh, the Naked Gun movies. Uh, he was snapped up by advertisers, fronted Hertz commercials. He was an American icon, a big achiever. Uh, and that's why it was such a big surprise and a big shock when he ended up in the back of that white vehicle you're looking at now following the murder, brutal stabbing of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman, there followed the trial of the century. You're looking at it there. And, you know, who can forget that daily coverage, live television that captivated not just the United States, but countries around the world, certainly the UK. Who can forget the lines from that trial? 
if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. There were gloves uh, involved in the murder, uh, gloves presented in the courtroom that were put on O.J. Simpson. It was a tight fit. He held it up towards the jury, his lawyer, Johnny Cochran, telling them, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. Well, acquit is what they did in the end. A black man accused of the murder of a white woman uh, was found not guilty, and his defence, as I say, uh, put the question to the jury, can a black man get a fair trial in these circumstances, given uh, his background, his ethnicity, and the ethnicity of the victim? And as you say, James, a hugely consequential and controversial a character, O.J. Simpson, of course, accused in that 1995 trial of the brutal murders of his ex-wife and uh, her friend, acquitted of those murders, and a man who became a national icon in the United States following his sporting prowess, but also a man who uh, it later transpired had a, a violent background, certainly to his partners, uh, regarding... Uh, his former partner, Nicole Johnson, uh, Nicole Brown Simpson, uh, police reports of, of the violence within their marriage uh, before her death. And of course, as you say, following his acquittal in 1995 in that criminal trial, a civil suit brought by the family of Ron Goldman did find OJ liable for the deaths of both Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. He was not just an icon on the pictures we've been talking about, but also uh, a, a, an icon on screen as well, appearing in a number of films. He talked about some of the comedic films he was in, Naked Gun, also checking that he was in Towering Inferno as well. It was a time when you didn't see many people like OJ on screen in the United States, hence uh, much of the reason for his stardom and the shock that gripped America when those uh, the accusations were made and the charges laid and that chase began. Uh, you're relaying there, James, as everyone can really remember the moment when that process began, when that car chase happened along that highway in California in that white Bronco driven by one of OJ's friends, AC Cowling, a former friend from his football days, and OJ in the back saying he did not want to be taken in. That chase eventually ended at his, his mansion in Hollywood. But as you'll remember, James, while OJ was being pursued by the police, a, a low-speed chase, a fleet of cars, no one moving particularly quickly in a television helicopter overhead, People had been lining the streets as they'd seen what was happening to get ahead of what essentially became a convoy of OJ and those police vehicles clapping as OJ was driving away from them. It was a spectacle and the trial became a spectacle as well. Trial of the century with a, a defence team described as the dream team made up of Alan Dershowitz, uh, Robert Kardashian, the father of Kim Kardashian and others, uh, Robert Shapiro, and of course, Johnny Cochran. Um, and that dream team were able to get OJ off. He was acquitted of the killings of uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and uh, Ron Goldman following that huge moment in court where the gloves did not fit. And as Johnny Cochran said, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit and acquit. The jury did uh, in 1995. As you were saying, James, controversy then followed OJ later on in his life. He was eventually sent to prison in 2008 uh, for a, an altercation in a hotel room where he was trying to get back some of his memorabilia. He was though released, wasn't he, of course, James, in uh, 2022 and, and, as you say, went on to live uh, fairly quietly, rather posting on social media every now and again, but he was uh, released from prison and, and now today the news that his, his death 
has come at the age of 76 following his, uh, his battle with cancer. Well, his family put on social media the news that OJ Simpson had died and here's what they said. On April the 10th, our father, Oranthal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asks, you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace. All right, let's bring in now um, Scott Lucas, a professor of American studies, for his uh, thoughts and uh, reflections on, on the passing, the death of O.J. Simpson uh, after suffering from prostate cancer. Scott Lucas, thanks for, for joining us. Appreciate you making uh, the time. Uh, First of all, your reflections on, on this news that we're uh, just coming to terms with in the last few minutes. Well, the, the passing of O.J. Simpson uh, brings to an end uh, not only a, uh, a very, very checkered life, a life marked by great ability, by celebrity, and then infamy. It brings to a close of an interesting cultural chapter in America uh, that has elements of race, that has elements of gender, uh, that has elements of violence all wrapped up in it. Um, if I could just speak personally for a moment, um, for me, and I think for many Americans, O.J. Simpson was uh, a hero. You know, he was a, a record-setting American football player, both at university, at the University of Southern California, and then with the Buffalo Bills. He set records for the most yards gained by an American running back in a single season. And that was significant, say for me, and I think for a lot of others, as, as white people, in my case in the American South, because this was a, a black athlete. This was a black athlete in that wave when American sports were really becoming integrated, um, when you, know, you were pushing back racial boundaries. And Simpson was at the forefront of it. He later on, of course, became a, a film star, uh, you know, in, in uh, disaster films like The Towering Inferno and The Naked Gun series. And, you know, in moving into the 1990s, you know, he continued to be in many cases sort of an icon. And then, of course, you had, you know, the infamous case where his wife, uh, Nicole Brown, and uh, the waiter, Ron Goodman, uh, a person who happened to just be in the wrong place at the wrong time, were murdered uh, outside Simpson's home in Los Angeles. And as you've just been hearing um, you know, from your correspondent, you know, the, the secret of events that followed it, because what you then had was not just Simpson celebrity, but in an era which preceded, you know, our 21st social media, this was sort of, you know, a forerunner of what we have these days, where the actual substance and the facts are almost overwhelmed by the spectacle. And the whole spectacle of the Simpson trial brought into a spectacle of race. It brought into the spectacle of gender, because again, you know, his wife had been brutally murdered. It brought into the question as to whether fairness would exist in the American legal system. For those who defended Simpson, they argued well, he couldn't get a fair trial because of his race. For those who criticized Simpson and thought he might be guilty, they said that Nicole Brown and Rod Goodman couldn't get justice because of his celebrity status and because of playing that race card. And that very quickly meant that with celebrity lawyers like Johnny Cochran, Robert Kardashian, the facts of the case almost evaporated to the point where, you know, yeah. it is still an unsolved murder, at least in the criminal courts. Uh, Simpson was found criminally liable two years later in order to pay $33 million in damages. And in that sense, I think it is not only a case that will never be resolved in terms of legally as to who did kill them, I think it won't be resolved culturally. I think it is still an open wound in American society, that case which pointed to wider issues that have not been resolved to this yeah. day. OK, Scott, thank you for those reflections. Stay with me, please, because I want to go to someone who was on uh, OJ's legal team, Alan Dershowitz. Uh, Alan Dershowitz, thanks very much for making the time to speak to us. First of all, your reflections on your time uh, with OJ Simpson. Well, it was a very dramatic time in American history. The country was divided along racial lines. And the evidence was divided. Uh, there was overwhelming evidence that might suggest that he did it. And then there was one piece of evidence that was tampered with, the sock that had his blood and the blood of the victim on it. And we were able to prove that the blood was poured by police officer Van Adder, and it contained a chemical in it that's found in test tubes, but not in the human body. 
And so the jury concluded that a very important piece of evidence was tampered with by the government. And that's the reason they acquitted. They didn't trust the rest of the evidence. And it really sent a very important message to police officers and prosecutors that if you tamper with evidence, even in a strong case, the jury is not going to believe you. And Alan, talk to us about America, but specifically L.A. at that time, in, in, through the prism of that sort of racial tension and the, you know, mm -hmm. the reputation of the LAPD, who uh, themselves were involved in the investigation, of course, into the killing of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. The LAPD had a terrible reputation. Uh, it had a reputation for planting evidence. It had a reputation for racial discrimination. It had a reputation for being almost a Marine Corps um, uh, some people called it an occupying army in the black community. So uh, the most important thing in the case was to pick a jury that would be understanding of that. And we picked a jury that consisted primarily of African-Americans and the prosecution um, was satisfied with the jury because it contained a, a, a number of black women. And uh, we had a jury expert who told us that black women are more likely to identify as blacks than as women. And the prosecution thought the opposite, and uh, uh, the, the verdict proved that we were probably correct in our assessment of, of the jury. But the most important piece of evidence was the framed piece of evidence, uh, the sock with the blood on it that had a chemical in it, not found in the human body, but found in test tubes. So that was the reason, largely the reason for the acquittal. The sock rather than the gloves. Everyone will remember that uh, that moment when uh, he tries on the gloves in the trial. They yeah. don't fit perfectly. Uh, is it right that they had been in a freezer or in some kind of deep storage and had shrunk slightly, so that's part of the reason very, why they didn't fit? Very likely. I was sitting literally two, just a couple of feet away from him when he tried on the glove. The prosecution could have had him try on the glove outside the hearing of the jury but they foolishly and arrogantly decided not to. And when he put it on, he went up to the jurors and he said, they're too small. And at that point, I was able to persuade him not to testify. I said to him, OJ, you've already testified. You went to the jury, you told them, you showed them that the glove was too small and you weren't cross-examined. And so you don't have to testify and he didn't. And then of course he testified at the criminal case, at the civil case, and he was, uh, he was uh, uh, convicted in the civil case. So it proved that we were right in not having him testify. We'll come on to some of that in a minute, if we can, uh, Alan. But let's just go back to, to sort of the moment this began on our television screen, certainly, with that car chase. And obviously, you were in the country at the time, in the city at the time, you were watching that. What were your feelings as you saw this beginning? I mean, you didn't know at that point you were going to be hired. No, I was not his lawyer. I was watching the National Basketball Association finals with my family in Charleston, South Carolina. And I said to them, that proves he's probably guilty and he may commit suicide. Um, you know, it was one of the largest watched events in the history of television. Everybody was, because nobody knew what the outcome would be. And um, he, he didn't. And then he hired me a few days later to be one of his lawyers, I took the case because it was at that point a capital case. He was facing the death penalty and I never turned down capital cases. And then uh, I continued to help him as a consultant largely. I argued some of the cases in front of the uh, jury. Um, but, um, but uh, uh, you know, it was a very divisive case in America, divided along racial lines, divided along lines of whether people saw the trial or didn't. It was interesting. People who actually watched the trial um, we're not surprised at the verdict as much as people who read about it in newspaper accounts, because the newspapers, for example, didn't present the evidence of the sock very uh, effectively. But if you saw it in person, you realize that there was a problem with the government's evidence. If I may, Alan, can you take us inside sort of the, the room, the consultation rooms when you were there with OJ and with Johnny Cochran and with the, the rest of what was called the dream team? Um, what were those conversations like? I mean, you guys, a lot of, I can imagine there was a lot of ego in those rooms, well, all trying to... A, it wasn't a dream team, it was a nightmare team. Everybody was fighting with each other. Um, people were uh, having very different views. There was great division about whether you should take the stand or not. I think I was the leading proponent of him not taking the stand. And F. Lee Bailey was the leading proponent of his taking the stand. And uh, ultimately it was the glove uh, when he was able to go in front of the jury and show them that the glove didn't fit. That led him to conclude, and he made the decision, 
not to take the stand. In a civil case, he took the stand and was mm. immediately found liable. Yeah, so look, in the criminal trial then, he wanted to all the way up to that point to, to go and defend himself on the stand, did he? He wanted to take the stand and we persuaded him not to. Right. So when you get to the... Sorry, Alan, when you get to the point of, 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 of acquittal, that's the end of, of sort of your... Uh, part in, in that trial, but then, as you mentioned, it goes to the, to the civil trial. And, and what did you make of that process? Were you a, well, a, a watcher had, of that as well? I had advised him to try to settle the case, um, advised him once he got the acquittal to try to disappear, not be part of the public, but he insisted on remaining in the public. And um, he uh, um, you know, ultimately went to jail on other grounds um, as well. I have to go now, though. Thank you. OK, Alan Dershowitz, who was... Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Alan. Uh, as I said, he, uh, he does have to leave, but uh, fascinating to speak to Alan Dershowitz, who was part of the, the legal team uh, that defended O.J. Simpson. They were described as the dream team, but Alan Dershowitz there just described them as the nightmare team because of all the differing opinions uh, involved in what should be done in the defence of Oronthal James Simpson. Let's just remind you of our... News this hour. The controversial former NFL star and actor OJ Simpson has died at the age of 76. In a statement posted to social media, his family said on the uh, April the 10th, our father, Oriental James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren during this time of transition. His family asks you respect their wishes for privacy and grace. Well, in February of this year, OJ went on social media to dismiss rumours of him going into hospice after undergoing chemotherapy for his prostate cancer. Hey, X-World. Hospice? Hospice? You talking about hospice? <laughs> no, I, I'm not in any hospice. I don't know who put that out there, but whoever put that out there, I guess it's like the Donald Singh. Can't trust the media. Uh, in any event, I'm hosting a ton of friends for, for the Super Bowl here in Las Vegas. And all is well, <laughs> you know. So, hey, guys, take care. Have a good Super Bowl weekend. Uh, that was him speaking uh, just for uh, the Super Bowl. Let's bring in our U.S. correspondent, James Matthews, for more on this. Uh, uh, James, it was fascinating to, to speak to Alan Dershowitz about the sort of the, the process, him making it quite clear that it was, you know, what he saw as a tampering of evidence that led to the acquittal in the 95 trial, but the latest civil suit, um, he lost that and was found liable for the killing of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman because OJ himself gave evidence. Yes, Kamali, yes. fascinating to hear that from somebody who who was in the room and who was standing by the side of an American icon as he was acquitted in the trial of the century. I mean, looking at that video there, a smiling, friendly, charismatic O.J. Simpson. That's the O.J. Simpson that America grew to knew and love. The O.J. Simpson they learned about over the course of that double murder trial was something altogether more dark. And, you know, O.J. Simpson, th this was a man who uh, was a domestic abuser. Make no mistake, he was violent, had been violent towards his ex-wife in the past. I mean, in 1989, uh, in a call to police at 3.30 in the morning, they were summoned to the residence of the, the Simpsons. Uh, when they got there, Nicole Brown Simpson, who would later be stabbed, de stabbed to death, remember, she emerged from the, boosie, the bushes saying, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. Uh, she'd been attacked by Simpson. He pleaded no contest to domestic violence at that time. That was five years uh, before Nicole Brown Simpson was murdered. On the night she and her friend Ron Goldman were murdered, um, they were found dead. Uh, the police were looking for O.J. Simpson because of his association with her. He'd taken a flight to Chicago and in due course uh, he was back in California. There ensued that car chase when he was in a white Ford Bronco, apparently with a gun to his head, according to 
uh, the former NFL colleague who was driving the vehicle, pursued by the police. And, of course, then there unfolded the murder trial, uh, all sorts of grisly prosecution evidence levelled against O.J. Simpson, but ultimately he was acquitted. You heard Alan Dershowitz say that that was due to government tampering of evidence. The moment, I suppose, the public at large will remember was the glove found at the murder scene that didn't fit O.J. Simpson in the courtroom. If the glove don't fit, said his lawyer, you must acquit, and acquitted he was. An American icon celebrated, but also somebody surrounded by extreme infamy for the rest of his life, and he's now dead at the age of 76. James Matthews, uh, there, an infamy uh, is right, uh, as James pointed out, they're acquitted of the killing of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman in 1995, found liable for their killings later in 97 in a civil suit. And uh, OJ had a history of domestic violence, as James was pointing out there, from a, a case in 1989 where he is uh, he attacked his uh, his wife Nicole Simpson uh, and the police were called let's bring in our um, uh, contributor professor scott lucas for for more on this and professor lucas look it's it's the controversy that surrounds oj simpson which kind of speaks to the complicated way uh, that we talk about him and the way that we'll remember him Yes, it will. Um, I think, you know, we could talk about the immediate controversy. You heard from Alan Dershowitz about the trial. He presented only one side of it. Um, there was mishandling of evidence by the L.A. police, and the L.A. police were already in disrepute um, for alleged uh, discrimination and beating of black people, something that led to the, uh, the L.A. unrest in 1992. So the O.J. Simpson case highlighted, I think, problems with the police force. On the other hand, uh, it's important to note that uh, on the preponderance of evidence in a civil court, slightly lower standard court, he still was found guilty in order to pay $33 million in charges, which points to that, yes, this was not a, you know, uh, kind of the, the criminal justice system, or at least it's not as simple as that. He himself had this very checkered history, which culminated eventually with over armed robbery in 2008. But I think it's the wider issues that continue to resonate. And that is, how does America come to grips not only with its past, but with its racial present? How does it do so also by not flipping it the other way and turning someone who happens to be celebrity possibly into, well, in a sense, absolving him while forgetting about the fact that two people, two innocent people were killed? Um, so that intersection of race, gender, and justice is something that the Simpson trial introduced, and it also introduced something that makes this day. When does the media not help us in terms of presenting the facts and presenting justice? The spectacle of the media stand in the way of that, and how do we cope with that in 2024, almost 30 years after this case that rocked America? And Scott, you mentioned the division, the, the tension in the United States at the time of uh, this trial and that acquittal. And of course, it came in 1994. The murder happened in 1994. The, the trial happened in 1995. In 92, there were the LA riots. There was uh, as well the, the beating of Rodney King in, in 1991. Los Angeles was essentially a, a powder keg. And into it was poured this celebrity trial, this hugely consequential televised moment that seemed to set uh, America apart on, on racial lines. Just give our, give our viewers and those who, you know, weren't watching it at the time, maybe were too young or weren't paying enough attention, a, a sense of, of, of how divided a society America was along those lines and how this particular trial, this, this crime, played into some of that. Uh, unfortunately, I put the question to Scott Luce, Lucas and he was unable to answer it. So perhaps I need to answer some of that question myself. America was a hugely divided society at, at this stage. It was divided along racial lines. And as James said earlier, as you can see from these pictures, when OJ was fleeing, people were out uh, clapping along 
as he was driving away from the police when that acquittal verdict came in the courtroom in 1995. Parts of America, Black America celebrated and, and, and White America were, were devastated by the jury's verdict. It's a case and a conclusion to a case that continues to resonate in a country that continues to be divided in many ways. Let me just remind you of the, the news this hour. The controversial former football star, OJ Simpson, has died at the age of 76. His family issued a statement, a brief statement, to social media. And it reads, on April the 10th, our father, Ornithal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren during this time of transition. His family asks that you respect their wishes for privacy and grace. Now, of course, O.J. Simpson's life, uh, the fulcrum of which was, of course, that trial in 1994, 1995, but he came to national prominence in the United States because of his exploits on the American football field, first as a college football player, a player that was highly decorated and set numerous records within the uh, college game of American football. And then he was drafted to the pro leagues, to the NFL, where he spent uh, 11 seasons with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, seasons of great success where he was able to break records again and again. He was a running back. If you know the game of American football, he's the one that you give the ball to and you ask him to run into the end zone to score you the points. His name was O.J. Simpson and they called him the Juice. He was that fast. And after that hugely successful decorated football career, he then used that celebrity at a time when there were not many black celebrities uh, at the top of uh, celebrity culture in the United States to, to transition into film and, and television work and going on to be hugely successful, featuring in a number of, of films, uh, remembered most by me, um, for his roles in some of those naked gun films, of course, played for laughs. Uh, but. Uh, a moment and uh, a role that he played and seemed to enjoy O.J. Simpson was uh, a celebrity star on the circuit within Los Angeles and was hugely successful, well-paid and wealthy. And then uh, following uh, many years of, of controversy, as we, as we talked about, the allegations of domestic violence and assault uh, in 1989, his wife and her friend, Ron Goldman, his wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, are found dead at the property. OJ is the main suspect and is then pursued and wanted in connection with those killings. Rather than turn himself into law enforcement, OJ goes on the run. And it was uh, an escape, a high speed escape, and you must you the word escape in inverted commas because the speeds that they reached on those highways in California under the glare of the media, under the glare of television cameras followed by a phalanx of police cars were not fast. And OJ, driven by his friend AC Cowling, uh, was telling police that they needed to back off because he was going to kill himself. He uh, eventually turned himself in once they had reached his mansion in Los Angeles and then after a brief time what began was the trial of the century a trial that was televised in the United States and around the world overseen by Judge Ito the prosecution led by Marcia Clark and Christopher Darden the defense team representing OJ Simpson described at the time and subsequently as the dream team it included Robert Kardashian, the father of Kim Kardashian, et al, Alan Dershowitz, who we spoke to earlier, Robert Shapiro, and uh, Johnny Cochran. Described as the dream team because they were all the most highly paid, successful lawyers 
that money could find and money could buy. But as we heard from Alan Dershowitz just a short while ago, he described them as the nightmare team because of the competing opinions, the differing egos, the, the challenges that all of them had in how they could best defend their clients. Alan Dershowitz saying that it was the mishandling, the planting, the use of evidence by the government, by Los Angeles police that eventually led to his acquittal, despite the fact that for many people it will be that moment when OJ was asked to try on gloves, gloves that were found bloodstained at the home where the uh, two Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were found dead. OJ tried on the gloves, they didn't fit, and he didn't give evidence. He was acquitted in 1995 on those charges, but as we said, later found uh, liable for the deaths of the two heir, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, uh, in a civil trial. Let's bring in our US correspondent, James Matthews, for a little more on this. Uh, James, uh, I want to try and get a sense from you as to, as to what the sort of the, the reaction has been to this news, which, is, which broke just before the hour here at four o'clock, my time, uh, to the death of OJ Simpson. As I was explaining to Scott Lucas in this interview, you have made clear to us in, in our conversations, a hugely controversial figure, but a consequential figure. So how he is talked about, how he's remembered, how we think about his impact on the United States and culture is it, it, complicated and difficult. It is complicated. That would be the word, Kamali. And I think in terms of reaction, that will be complicated too. And I imagine divided along similar lines to the division at that 1995 trial, the defence, as we have been discussing, uh, they pushed hard this notion that a black man could not get a fair trial, uh, having been charged with the murder of a white person, in this case, two white people, one of whom was his ex-wife. Ultimately, the predominantly black jury uh, acquitted him. It may be worth uh, refreshing some of the detail, Kamali, surrounding what he was charged with and the circumstances of that uh, double murder, because we see much of O.J. Simpson smiling upon acquittal, smiling in recent videos, smiling, celebrating his success as a hugely uh, influential and iconic NFL player and star of the silver screen, films such as Towering Inferno and so on. But the crime that he was accused of was a double murder. Um, he was a domestic abuser. He had in the past uh, acknowledged that he had attacked Nicole Brown Simpson, his ex-wife, on the day of the murder, June the 12th, uh, 1994, Nicole Brown Simpson had been at a restaurant with uh, her two children. Uh, she left eyeglasses in that restaurant, then gone home, contacted the restaurant to say, look, I've left my eyeglasses. Uh, and a waiter, Ron Goldman, the man who would ultimately be murdered along with her, he was a waiter there, he took the eyeglasses back to her house. What then ensued was a violent double murder. Nicole Brown Simpson was found with stab wounds to her head and to her neck. I mean, she was almost decapitated. Ron Goldman was found with uh, stab wounds to uh, his body, abdomen and so on. There appeared to have been a short struggle in the cases of both. In terms of O.J. Simpson, the police came across this murder scene. They wanted to contact him. Uh, to let him know that his ex-wife had been found dead. Um, and thereupon they came across a limousine driver who'd been at O.J. Simpson's house. That night he was due to fly to Chicago. He had a, an event with Hertz executives. He had fronted adverts for them, commercials. Uh, and the limousine driver told police that there was no sign of O.J. Simpson when he was there, but at one point he saw a shadowy figure emerge and enter the house, enter O.J. Simpson's house, and then the lights came on. It's just as if he hadn't been inside the property. Uh, the police duly arrived. They found blood on the door, and on, that, on those premises they found a glove with blood on it. That, would, that glove would become a central feature of the trial 
to follow. But that night, the night of the murder, O.J. Simpson went into the limousine, headed to the airport, made the trip to Chicago. The limousine driver said that he appeared agitated, he was sweating, he was complaining of being hot. The police say that when they contacted O.J. Simpson that night, um, he asked about the children. The children had been asleep upstairs in the property where the murders took place. He didn't ask the police, were the children harmed? Uh, he asked the police, did the children see what happened? And detectives thought that was a, a very curious question to ask. In due course, following the examination of DNA uh, on the various bits of evidence that police had retrieved, they decided to arrest O.J. Simpson. And uh, it was several days after the murder. It was done by arrangement with his lawyers. Police arranged for O.J. Simpson to come in, surrender himself. They didn't think that somebody as high profile as this movie star, former NFL icon, would do anything other than submit to his arrest. There was something like a 1,000 members of the media outside the, the police station in question awaiting O.J. Simpson's arrival. But what duly ensued was the car chase, the white Ford Bronco being pursued along the freeway by, at low speed, by a number of police cars because O.J. Simpson did not uh, give himself up voluntarily. He'd been allowed to delay his surrender to go and have mental health checks. Uh, he was deemed to be a suicide risk by those around him. He had uh, drafted letters, essentially saying goodbye to uh, members of his family. So we had this car chase. Uh, he would, the vehicle was driven by one of his old NFL teammates. O.J. Simpson was in the back, and according to the teammate, uh, who he told police that he had a gun to his head. O.J. had a gun to his head and was suicidal. Bizarrely, given his status and his popularity, uh, as this uh, chase ensued, lasting several hours, people were watching it on TV, they, many of them, went to the roadside. They lined the route of this chase. Uh, I mean, a double murderer, I suspect double murderer in the car. These people were celebrating O.J. Simpson, shouting his name, shouting, save the juice. That's what he was known as, O.J., the juice, orange juice. Uh, so we had this bizarre, macabre scene, uh, which clearly had sinister uh, undertones, uh, uh, an alleged double murderer in the back of this vehicle pursued by the police. Ultimately, um, he surrendered himself. There was an arrest, and we had this, this trial that played out live on television. If you didn't know O.J. Simpson before this trial, then the world certainly knew who he was afterwards. And it was a merging of stories, the O.J. story, the, the good, the bad, and the extremely ugly. A man who rose to fame as a black icon, as a sporting icon. Uh, and made the transfer naturally onto the screen. Uh, you know, good-looking, charismatic, real presence and real iconic status in, in America. Um, so everybody knew the good of O.J. Simpson. Everybody celebrated O.J. Simpson, but everybody came to know uh, the very dark story of not just the double murder accusations, but the history of domestic abuse. And that largely fed into a very strong feeling uh, across America among one constituency that this was a guilty man waiting to be convicted. It came as an extreme surprise to that particular constituency when uh, he was acquitted. And we heard Alan Dershowitz, OJ's lawyer in that trial, a man who was in the room uh, discussing uh, in a very compulsive way the kind of detail that went on in his defence, and much of it centred around this bloody glove, the famous bloody glove, a glove that was found uh, on O.J. Simpson's property, deemed to have matched another glove that was found at the murder scene. Now, the prosecution case was that these were the gloves worn by O.J. Simpson. They brought him into the courtroom, produced the glove, he put the glove on, and it was a very tight fit, too tight a fit, to the extent that Johnny Cochran, O.J. Simpson's lawyer, told the jury in a very famous 
uh, iconic line from American legal history, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. That is what the jury ultimately did. And we heard from Alan Dershowitz that the trial turned on that moment because O.J. Simpson wanted to testify. But following that, Dershowitz said to him, you don't need to testify. You've just done everything you need to do before that jury, showing them that that glove, said oh, to have been worn by the killer, the double killer, does not fit you. Therefore, they will know that you are not the killer. Fascinating, a fascinating insight into a fascinating, iconic trial from Alan Dershowitz, a man who defended Simpson in the murder trial. But as we see there, you know, he wasn't finished with court action. There was a civil suit, uh, a jury, and that civil suit two years later uh, deemed that he had was liable for murder. He was ordered to pay damages. Then in 2008, he was convicted of armed robbery, kidnapping, having gone with others, and there were weapons involved, to a Las Vegas hotel room, uh, seeking to retrieve memorabilia, items of memorabilia, from somebody who he deemed shouldn't have them. And uh, that was a crime he was convicted of, spent time in jail for that. OK. James uh, Matthews there, thank you for that. Let's uh, bring in now Arriva Martin, a civil rights uh, attorney, joining us now live. Arriva Martin, thank you for making the time to speak with us. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to get your reflections on, on this news. Sad day, obviously, for O.J. Simpson's family. He has children, he has grandchildren. They said they were with him as he uh, transitioned. He obviously had been battling cancer that wasn't well known, not well publicized in the media. Uh, after his release from that Nevada prison, he has led or had led a pretty quiet and private life. Uh, obviously a very complicated and controversial figure. Uh, listening to James uh, recount the trial and some of the highlights of the trial, I think just uh, remind everyone about the uh, the dual, the dual personalities in, in some ways that were uh, on display or have been on display with O.J. Simpson throughout his life since his rise to fame uh, at USC, University of Southern California, as a football star. And, uh, Arriva, give us a, a sense of, of what O.J. meant as the icon before the trial, before the controversy, what he meant as an icon in America. Well, he was uh, one of the country's largest stars in the sense that he had transcended football. He had transcend, transcended sports to become a pop culture icon. He was famous for that Hertz commercial, running through airports. If you didn't know him uh, because you didn't follow football, you definitely knew him after watching those commercials, those wildly popular commercials. Uh, he also had become a movie star. He broke a lot of racial barriers, becoming one of the first African-American athletes to have uh, a large commercial deal like the Hertz deal, one of the first African-American athletes to uh, be able to make the transition into film and television. Uh, for many, he was one of the first black athletes who became a popular pitchman and uh, broke down barriers and, and mm. uh, you know, shattered stereotypes about black athletes and their ability to be pitchmen in mainstream uh, commercials. So he broke a lot of barriers, but he also had, uh, he made a lot of enemies. A lot of people found him to be arrogant, uh, found him to be uh, a, a very um, self-absorbed mm -hmm. uh, person who's allowed a lot of that fame to really change him as a person. He was also found to have committed domestic abuse as well uh, in 1989 with Nicole Brown Simpson, and that's, of course, before he's put on trial for her murder. Talk us through that trial process, if you can, uh, Ariva, as you saw it, as, uh, as an attorney, watching on as the trial of the century unfolded. You know, the, the domestic violence, definitely. Let's talk about that first. Uh, domestic violence was not treated as seriously as it should have been on that uh, prior to uh, the revelation of the violence that O.J. Simpson perpetrated on his wife. So after learning of that, we definitely saw a change in the way law enforcement agencies 
prosecutorial offices throughout the country started treating victims of domestic violence. So uh, he also uh, can be credited with uh, changing the way cases were prosecuted. The trial was, was troubling in a lot of ways. And uh, James put it best when he says that there was a constituency, I, uh, a.k.a. white people in America, who did not believe that he was not guilty. But mm-hmm. what you can't miss when you're talking about the trial is the rampant and pervasive misconduct of the Los Angeles Police Department. So whether you believe he was guilty or not, we have a process in our country, and it's called due process. And if police engage in misconduct, uh, absolutely, positively, you cannot find okay. someone guilty. So uh, despite what people may have thought about his innocence or guilt, you, you have to acknowledge the misconduct by the police department. Absolutely. OK, Arriva Martin, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there for now with you. Thank you very much, though, uh, Arriva Martin, a, a civil rights term. Thanks for being with us. Now... Back in 1995, Sky News, of course, covered the acquittal of O.J. Simpson. And here is that report. At his trial, he was accused of slipping back into his house under the cover of darkness. Today, Simpson came home with the world's media watching. Just a few hours before, he'd stood in court, facing the prospect of a lifetime in prison. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant or jaw... Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. The family of Ronald Goldman were devastated. Prosecution lawyers Christopher Darden and Marcia Clark were stunned. Johnny Cochran and Simpson hugged each other with delight. After more than a year in jail, O.J. Simpson was a free man. All right, the defendant having been acquitted of both charges, he is ordered, transported to an appropriate sheriff's facility and released forthwith. Then came the reaction, first from the defense. I'd just like to say how grateful we are for this this verdict, because we think this verdict bespeaks justice. We never wavered in our faith. We were always optimistic. The prosecution couldn't believe that all their efforts had been in vain. But I'm not bitter. Yeah, I'm not angry, but I'd also like to thank the, the lawyers uh, on our prosecution team. I am honored to have uh... Christopher Darden for once lost for words. President Clinton watched the verdict in the White House and then issued this statement. Uh, the jury heard uh, the evidence and rendered its verdict. Our system of justice requires respect for their decision. At this moment, our thoughts and prayers should be with the families of the victims of this terrible crime. Ron Goldman's family hoped to win a civil action against Simpson, but that won't cost him his freedom. I deeply believe that this country lost today. Justice was not served. And I just looked at O.J. when when they they did the said the verdict and I I just I just looked at him and I I'm telling you I never I never felt such rage knowing that he murdered he murdered my son and he's getting away with it on one side scenes of anguish but at the Simpson home sheer delight as the family celebrated with the lawyers who set OJ free Well, O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76 after a battle with cancer. Orenthal, James Simpson's family, uh, posted to social media announcing the news. O.J. Simpson, who was a star of the American football field, a professional athlete, uh, having spent 11 seasons at the Buffalo Bills, winning accolade after accolade, then transitioned into a movie star, a celebrity in Los Angeles in the 80s and early 90s, uh, being in adverts and films and, and television. But he went from American icon to infamous when he was charged and then acquitted of the murder of his ex-wife and Ron Goldman. We're going to have more on O.J. Simpson in the next hour.
It's five o'clock. I'm Mark Austin. This is the News Hour, 60 minutes of news, analysis and interviews. We begin right now with the top stories this hour. Breaking news. It was the trial that gripped America and the world. O.J. Simpson is dead at the age of 76. Tensions grow still further in the Middle East as the U.S. fears Iran is on the brink of a significant revenge attack on Israel. Also delivered too late, the sub-postmistress wrongly jailed while pregnant rejects an apology from the boss who celebrated her sentence. I'd just like to place on record an apology to Sima Misra and family because of the way this has been perceived. I'm a living creature and they did mention a test case and then apologising after 14 years. It's not... I haven't accepted yet. Remanded in custody, the man charged with the murder of a young mother stabbed to death as she pushed her baby in a pram. And the Met Police reviews its decision to charge TV presenter Caroline Flack with assaulting her boyfriend shortly before she took her own life. First tonight, he was at the centre of a criminal trial that gripped the world. O.J. Simpson, the former American football great who was controversially cleared of double murder, has died at the age of 76. He had been undergoing treatment for cancer. He earned fame and fortune through playing in the NFL and acting in films like Naked Gun, but uh, this was overshadowed, of course, by a famous police chase broadcast live on TV and the subsequent court case dubbed The Trial of the Century. In a post on X, his family said on April 10th, our father, Oranthal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asks that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace. Well, earlier, Sky News spoke to O.J. Simpson's former lawyer, Alan Dershowitz. Well, it was a very dramatic time in American history. The country was divided along racial lines, and the evidence was divided. Uh, there was overwhelming evidence that might suggest that he did it, and then there was one piece of evidence that was tampered with, the sock that had his blood and the blood of the victim on it, and we were able to prove that the blood was poured by police officer Van Adder, and it contained a chemical in it that's found in test tubes but not in the human body. And so the jury concluded that uh, a very important piece of evidence was tampered with by the government, and that's the reason they acquitted. They didn't trust the rest of the evidence. Well, our U.S. correspondent James Matthews joins me now. And, uh, James, well, this, this car chase and the subsequent trial gripped America, certainly, but also divided America. It certainly did, uh, along cultural lines, uh, Mark, and racial lines as well. And when it came to that court case, that was one of the key strands of the defence for O.J. Simpson. Could a black man in California at that time get a fair trial for the alleged double murder of white people? In this case, his former wife, uh, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, uh, Ronald Goldman, it led his arrest to that car chase, the, the white Ford Bronco. Police pursued O.J. Simpson. They believed him to be the murderer, uh, following DNA checks on evidence found at the scene. And one particular piece of evidence that played very prominently during the trial was a glove the, at the murder scene and a, a matching glove that was found at O.J. Simpson's property. The prosecution said that's the glove worn by the murderer and that murderer was O.J. Simpson. In court, famously, he tried on the glove. It was a tight fit and his lawyer told the jury, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. And that's what a predominantly black jury, Julie, did. But the history of O.J. Simpson uh, is good, bad and extremely ugly, Mark. He started out uh, from a poor neighbourhood, a kid with rickets, who grew to become one of the biggest stars in American football, signed by the Buffalo Bills, a running back who broke all sorts of records, sporting records, and became uh, an NFL icon. His good looks, his charisma, his presence, iconic status, allowed him to make an easy transfer onto the silver screen. He was a star of films like Towering Inferno, the Naked Gun movies. He also fronted Hertz, 
commercial running through airports. An extremely famous figure in the United States. I suppose internationally, many of us were introduced to OJ uh, when he was arrested and we learned of the dark side of this American icon. Previously, he had been uh, found to have domestically abused Nicole Brown Simpson, police being called at one stage to his property at three in the morning. She emerged from the bushes saying, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. And Simpson acknowledged, he, he declared no contest to domestic abuse at that time. So he was a violent individual. That was a matter of public record. He'd split from Nicole Brown Simpson. And that murder took place at her property in California. The, the two children, their two children were asleep upstairs. She was stabbed in the head and the neck, almost decapitated. Uh, Ron Goldman, who'd been a waiter, who was a friend of Nicole Brown Simpson, he was a waiter in a restaurant she had just yes, dined well, at. She left her glasses behind and asked, could somebody bring them to her? Ron Goldman duly did so uh, and paid for that with his life. The thinking of detectives was that Nicole Brown Simpson was the target for murder. Ron Goldman was killed to silence him as a witness. Thereafter, O.J. Simpson flew to Chicago. He had an appointment with Hertz officials in that city. There was a limousine driver waiting to drive him to the airport. He said the lights were out when he went at the appointed hour to the house of O.J. Simpson. He saw a shadowy figure coming into the property. Then the lights were on. Police found blood on the, the handle of O.J. Simpson's vehicle, which was awkwardly parked that night. He seemed irritated, stressed. He was complaining about it being hot on the way to the airport. The limousine driver said he brought four pieces of luggage with him, but at the airport he only checked three pieces of luggage. Detectives think he dumped one piece of luggage in airport trash, luggage that contained the murder weapon and clothing that he was wearing at the time. Ultimately, he was brought back to LA. He, the plan had been uh, that he was going to submit himself willingly, voluntarily to police. They didn't think that he would uh, avoid arrest given his high profile status, but there ensued that low speed car chase on the freeways of LA, lasting several hours. People lined the streets shouting, save the juice. They were watching it. Those who weren't there in person were watching it live on TV. He was inside that white Ford Bronco. Uh, it was being driven by an old NFL colleague of his. He called police to say, I've got OJ in the back. Who He'd already written a suicide note, OJ Simpson. Uh, his NFL friend at the wheel said, he's got a gun to his head. So this chase lasted for several hours. In his possession, in that car, O.J. Simpson had $8,000 worth of cash, an American passport, his passport, uh, and also a fake uh, moustache and, and beard. So to all intents and purposes, it looks like he might have been trying to make a break for it. Ultimately, his coach called him on the phone in the car and talked him down, talked him into surrender. Uh, he duly did so. And thereafter, there was the trial, the famous trial, the most famous trial of the century, as it was dubbed at the time, the trial that ultimately uh, acquitted O.J. Simpson of the double murder. Subsequently, he would do prison time in 2008. He was convicted of kidnap and armed robbery. He'd gone into a Las Vegas hotel room uh, trying to get memorabilia back from a particular individual. There were weapons involved and uh, he served a jail sentence. Ultimately, he was freed. Laterally, he laid fairly low. I mean, he was active on social media. We heard from O.J. Simpson on Twitter commenting about sporting matters, politics and so on. Uh, but he was suffering from prostate cancer. There were reports that he had been in a hospice in his final few months. He posted a video to say that that wasn't the case. Don't believe everything you need, you read in the media. But ultimately, uh, he died from his condition, died at the age of 76. Yeah, and we're, we're hoping in a moment, actually, to speak to a lawyer who covered it as, a, as an analyst, covered the trial as an analyst. But even before the trial, James, um, I mean, he tried to portray himself as transcending racial barriers. I see he was, he used to say all the time, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Yeah, 
And that, uh, that for the marketing people around O.J. Simpson was the beauty of him. Uh, he was an individual who um, was every inch the, the rags to riches story and the fact of his ethnicity um, made, uh, allowed people around him uh, to sell him as an individual who did indeed uh, transcend uh, racial barriers. And if you looked at the career and success of O.J. Simpson, the people who bought into him, uh, essentially the United States at large, then, uh, you know, who would argue with uh, his own thoughts about himself, his status, what he meant to America uh, culturally, uh, politically and racially. So, yes, he was an individual for all those reasons who earned his iconic status, not just keep, keep. on sporting grounds, but also on cultural grounds. OK, James, thank you very much indeed. And we can speak now to Charles Rosenberg, a lawyer who covered the O.J. Simpson trial as an analyst. Uh, thank you very much indeed for being with us. And we've been talking about this car chase that gripped uh, the nation, followed by the trial that gripped the nation. And I just wonder, what was it like following that extraordinary trial so closely as you did? Well, it was very interesting. Um, you know, among other things, uh, I'm not a football fan, but even I know who, knew who O.J. Simpson was, um, so, which indicates his, his celebrity. Um, the trial was very interesting from many points of view, one of them being that uh, everybody in the country was interested in it. I, I don't think there was any single person I ever ran into who hadn't, if not watching it, hadn't been following it on some level. And was it... I mean, it did divide, didn't it? It became a very divisive issue as people watched that trial, as the trial progressed. Yeah, especially uh, when the verdict came down and he was quitted. And there were many people who were outraged by that acquittal. And there were other people who uh, thought it was great that he was acquitted. So, yeah, there was something of a divide about it for a while. Right. And what about the role of Johnny Cochran? He had this what he called the, the dream team, or what was called at the time the dream team of lawyers. How significant was Johnny Cochran's role in that? Well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, he was, uh, he's since passed away, a very charismatic lawyer. And certainly he had the jury on some level in the palm of his hand because he got them to vote for acquittal against a great deal of evidence suggesting he was guilty. And so, he, clearly, it, would some other lawyer have been as good? Who knows? But certainly, he did the job. And there were many dramatic moments, uh, weren't there, Charlie? But, I mean, the, the gloves, perhaps, was one of the most dramatic when it became clear that the defence were going to prove that a glove could have been planted. And then there was the moment where O.J. Simpson tried on the gloves and they clearly didn't fit. Just describe what that was like, that day was like. Well, I think it was it was pretty dramatic because, you know, uh, I guess nobody really knew whether they'd fit or not until he tried them on. And of course, many people say he intentionally spread his hand apart so they wouldn't fit. Uh, but, uh, and also there was a lot of criticism of the prosecution for suggesting that be done because uh, the normal rule in a trial is you never do a demonstration you can't utterly control. And, of course, they didn't control it. So there was a lot of criticism of them for even uh, suggesting it be done. Yeah, and um, we were talking just earlier about this issue of uh, the, how race became an issue in the trial when one of the lawyers said, can a black man get justice in these circumstances? How much was that a factor? How much did that play into the trial as it went along? Race itself? Well, of course, it really wasn't mentioned in the trial itself uh, as an issue very much. Uh, it was sort of the commentary that surrounded it, really. And so I suppose a lot of people viewed it through a racial lens, uh, but then a lot of people didn't. So. How do you think O.J. Simpson will be remembered? Well, I don't think he's going to be remembered primarily as a football player. He's going to be remembered as a person who, uh, by many people, who was guilty but got away with it, and by other people who think that there was a police conspiracy and uh, it was appropriate that he was acquitted. So I think he's going to be remembered in, in a mixed kind of way. 
But the other thing he's going to be remembered as, perhaps, is having been the most significant broadcast trial in the United States up to that point, which sort of set the public in mind that there should be broadcasts of trials, and there have been a lot of broadcasts of trials since then. Yeah, I mean, do you think, in terms of, you know, setting the way forward, if you like, on televised trials, this was, this was absolutely key, would you say? Yeah, I think it was because before the Simpson trial, there was a lot of thought that trials should be broadcast, and even the federal court system was moving towards having a, a pilot program to do that. And then a lot of judges became, I don't know, frightened is the right word, but uh, certain anxious about the broadcasting of trials. And there was a time when then it didn't happen very much. But then I think people have become more comfortable with it, including people in the justice system. And so uh, there now is are a lot of broadcasts of state trials. There still is no broadcasting of federal criminal trials. Was the worry that, um... Charles, that it would simply become a, a sort of form of entertainment? Well, I think the worry was more specific that it was going to influence the jury in some fashion, that it would, that jurors would be, well, jurors don't appear on camera, that jurors would see lawyers and other people playing to the camera rather than trying to face the trial. Although my attitude about that was, well, jurors, uh, lawyers always play to the camera. In effect, the camera is the jury. So I don't know that it really changes things that much. But that's just my personal opinion. Right, and I think I'm right, just finally, I think I'm right in saying that you wrote this book, How to Watch the Trial and Realise Exactly What's Going On, or words to that effect, I think. Um, what did you mean by that, that it was such a complicated trial, or that, because everybody was probably following it anyway? Well, I think uh, what I meant by that is I'd watched a lot of coverage yes, of the, well, what we I call the preliminary the hearings, that, and I think so that, uh, that a lot of people were not understanding how a criminal trial really works. And I said to my wife, well, somebody ought to write a book about how it really works. And she said, I should do that. And she said, well, why don't you shut up and actually do it? So I did. <laughs> and uh, and that, that was how that yeah. book came about. So Yeah. All right. Well, Charles, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming on You're the welcome. news hour. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you very much. And by the way, here's the uh, Sky News report from 1995 when O.J. Simpson was found not guilty of murdering his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and a friend, Ron Goldman, in what was dubbed the trial of the century. At his trial, he was accused of slipping back into his house under the cover of darkness. Today, Simpson came home with the world's media watching. Just a few hours before, he'd stood in court, facing the prospect of a lifetime in prison. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. The family of Ronald Goldman were devastated. Prosecution lawyers Christopher Darden and Marcia Clark were stunned. Johnny Cochran and Simpson hugged each other with delight. After more than a year in jail, O.J. Simpson was a free man. All right, the defendant having been acquitted of both charges, he is ordered, transported to an appropriate sheriff's facility and released forthwith. Then came the reaction, first from the defense. I'd just like to say how grateful we are for this, this verdict, because we think this verdict bespeaks justice. We never wavered in our faith. We were always optimistic. The prosecution Any couldn't believe that all their efforts had today. been in vain. But I'm not bitter, and I'm not angry. But I'd also like to thank the, the lawyers uh, on our prosecution team. I am honored to have uh... Christopher Darden, for once, lost for words. President Clinton watched the verdict in the White House and then issued this statement. Uh, the jury heard uh, the evidence and rendered its verdict. Our system of justice requires respect for their decision. At this moment, our thoughts and prayers should be with the families of the victims of this terrible crime. Ron Goldman's family hoped to win a civil action against Simpson, but that won't cost him his freedom. I deeply believe that this country lost today justice was not served. And I just looked at O.J. when, when 
they, when they did the said the verdict and I I just I just looked at him and I I'm telling you I never I never felt such rage knowing that he murdered he murdered my son and he's getting away with it on one side scenes of anguish but at the Simpson home sheer delight as the family celebrated with the lawyers who set OJ free that was the Sky News report from uh, 1995. Let's get the rest of the news now and to the Middle East and the growing threat of an escalation of violence in the region. The US is desperately trying to deter an attack on Israel, pledging ironclad support amid fears that Tehran could launch reprisals for an attack that killed senior Iranian military officials. Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has said the evil regime must be punished and it will be punished. We are in challenging times. We are in the middle of the war in Gaza, which continues in full force. At the same time, we continue our non-stop efforts to return our hostages. But we are also preparing for scenarios of challenges from other arenas. We established a simple principle. Whoever hurts us, we hurt them. We are preparing to meet the security needs of the State of Israel, both in defence and in attack. I and the people of Israel trust you, and may we all have great success. And speaking last night, the US President Joe Biden said his commitment to help Israel defend itself in case of an Iranian attack was ironclad. As I told Prime Minister Netanyahu, our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. Let me say it again, ironclad. We're going to do all we can to protect Israel's security. Let's join our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkel. Uh, good evening, Alistair. And clearly the United States has reason to think a revenge attack is imminent. Well, I think everybody assumed that once Israel had carried out that attack on the 1st of April at the Iranian consulate in the Syrian capital, Damascus, Iran probably would be forced, compelled to act in order to uh, uphold its own reputation in the Middle East um, and made, make sure that it wasn't being made a mockery of, uh, but also because uh, the uh, well, one of the people killed in that attack was a very senior Iranian general. So everybody expected Iran uh, would probably retaliate. But in the last 24 hours, intelligence has leaked or been briefed in America suggesting that attack could be imminent, uh, either within hours or days. It could be that the Americans are trying to push that out there, um, get the information out there to sort of somewhat call Iran's bluff, say, look, we know what you're up to, uh, don't do it. The other um, thing we're hearing is that the Americans are pushing every channel, uh, both to the Iranians saying, you know, have some restraint, but also to the Israelis saying if they do attack, you know, you'd need to have some restraint as well, not to then retaliate further, you know, lest this spiral into something that gets completely out of control. So now, here, particularly in Israel, people are waiting, waiting to see what happens. The working assumption is that, is that if Iran is going to carry out some retaliatory strike against uh, Israel, a number of things could happen. Firstly, it, we assume, would be a bit like for like. The Israelis attacked the, Israeli, uh, the Iranian consulate in Damascus and targeted military officials, so Iran might do something similar to the Israelis. And secondly, it might not come from Iran. It could be that Iran chooses to use one of its proxies around the region or some of its militia over the border in Syria, because Iran, throughout the six months of war between Israel and Hamas, has made it pretty clear it does not want to be dragged into a conflict. So it has a dilemma, how to respond, but not find itself on the march towards war with Israel. OK, Alistair, thanks very much indeed. Now, the former managing director of the post office has apologised to a former sub-postmistress for celebrating her conviction and imprisonment while she was pregnant. David Smith previously congratulated post office prosecutors on a job well done in jailing Seema Misra for theft. Here's what he told the inquiry. I'd, I'd just like to place on record an apology to Sima Misra and family because of the way this has been perceived and portrayed subsequently and looking at it through their eyes rather than through my